you here on the Sunday Journal. Thanks for staying with us on this a very important topic here. We're going in two parts today on the program on this issue of substance abuse, heroin abuse, opiate abuse here on Cape Cod and what it's doing to the community. And we're looking for some solutions as to what's being done in the community to deal with it. I'll reintroduce our panel today. Beth Albert is the director of the Barnesville County Human Services Department. Beth, again, thanks again for being here today. Appreciate it very much. Morning. Terry Ahern with uh, Cape Cod Healthcare, the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Governmental Affairs. Terry. Good morning. And Wendy Northcross, so who last left last left us with our comments in the last segment of the CEO of the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce. And Wendy, thanks very much. Thanks, all right, so I'm going to open up some questions here. Now this is where <clears throat> I want all of us to kind of just, you know, jump in when you want to here. You don't have to necessarily <laughs> raise your hand. We're not in school here. But uh, for each of you, what is the what is the solution here? I know it's such a it's such a hard question. I look at this and say, I see all what you folks are doing. I see what the healthcare institution is doing in terms of education prevention. I see what Barnesville County is doing in terms of education. And what Wendy, what you folks are trying to do with your employers. But somewhere along the way, again, this is my opinion here, somewhere along the way we have to get to the root of it, which is the heroin that's coming here in the first place. I know that's not really within the the, the wheelhouse of what you folks are here was talking about, but what are you hearing out there as to how we can get at that? Do you have any thoughts or ideas? You know, how do we how do we get to the heart of that? I mean, uh, one thing we saw in the documentary from HBO is that, and again, this becomes a political question. I'm not asking people to get political here, but a lot of folks and experts have said that as marijuana gets legalized around the country, uh, mm-hmm. Mexican drug cartels and others are looking at, they're, they're pushing uh, cheaper heroin towards us right. because they're not making money anymore in marijuana. Well, that's what our district attorney said when the governor, um, you know, was talking to this issue several weeks ago. Uh, D.A. O'Keefe got up and said, gateway drugs <clears throat> aren't helping here. And as we legalize those gateway drugs, we have to be really mindful of what we're doing. So if marijuana becomes um, legalized, the, the people that make a lot of money selling it now, I mean, this is the whole th- the economics of this whole issue, that money get um, chain gets diverted into other things that they can sell. The, the sad part about it is that this particular epidemic with heroin, um, it, it's such a vicious drug and it's such an inexpensive drug that's a really bad combination. Terry, let me go to you from the healthcare standpoint. What type of um, responsibility does the medical, I'm not talking about necessarily just Cape Cod Healthcare, but in general, the medical profession? Because a lot of this, from what we saw, starts with some of these prescriptions from opiates. I know that one of the uh, subjects in the in the HBO film was uh, a young uh, person who was playing sports and you know living a normal life, if you will, normal in quotes, mm-hmm. and then got injured, and from there w- that was the downfall. Got prescribed for opiates, and then after that, you know, things just went downhill from there. What is the medical profession doing? Are they are they taking some responsibility in terms of being careful about prescribing, over prescribing, etc.? Yes. Actually, there's quite a lot going on in that area, both through not only the Mass Hospital Association, also the Mass Medical Society. At Cape Cod Healthcare, we have a physician hospital organization, so there's education around that as well. So a lot of this centralizes, uh, I think, in the emergency departments. We sometimes have people coming in, either they're injured or they may be um, suffering from a a drug issue or they may be drug-seeking. So there are a lot of elements that they've been working on. Some of the things that they've been looking at is um, more safer and more effective prescribing uh, guidelines, uh, limits. Of course, the governor's bill also addresses some of that. Uh, We, as part of our programming this year, held some education forums. They were called Scope of Pain Summits, and they were open to anyone, whether you are a Cape Cod healthcare physician or in the dental uh, community, because that's also another area that's been identified or just another type of practitioner. And we had 120 participants over the course. We held them across the Cape where people could come in and get some increasing education about the impact. I think a lot of it's going to come to education and teaching so that when patients are given a prescription that they understand the risk. Um, Also better screening in terms of who may have, be more likely to have issues. And then there's the whole tracking and monitoring piece of how much have people been prescribed already. So I would say that definitely um, the physician community and the broader provider community um, is is looking at that. Um, I think the other side of that, not specific to your question, but I think it's kind of important and to follow up on what Wendy was saying is getting kids who, before they start, using those gateway right. drugs. And so a lot of the programming um, is around doing youth education, youth summits, supporting things like the Boys and Girls Club and basketball leagues and things that are more fun to do so that the lure of getting started to begin with. So, you know, you have people in different levels. You have people who've never started that we want to stop and we want to educate. Then you have people who are t- at risk and maybe toying with drugs and then 
then you have the 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 beginning and active drug users, and then you have the more hard, um, more difficult cases where people have been using drugs for a period of time. So I think you need different strategies for those different segments. There's not a one size fits all, but certainly across all of those, physicians are an important you know uh, component in terms of how they how they prescribe and how people understand. The other thing I think that's very important that we're starting to look at, and we know we need to do more work, is integrating behavioral health and primary care. And so screening tools, when when you're at your physician's office and you're there for your annual physical and, and what kind of risk factors, and it's not, frankly, it's not just around substance use and uh, illicit drugs, mm-hmm. it's around prescription meds and, and alcohol as well. So I think that there's a lot to be done in that area. I'll, I'll take the blame if uh, what I'm going to say now is a little controversial again, sure. and, and if you don't want to weigh in on it, you can all stay silent <laughs> if you want to. I'll know you, but uh, one thing that I've been thinking about, and especially after I watched the documentary and talking with a lot of law enforcement uh, recently about this, is uh, does Big Pharma, does they have some responsibility here? They have created drugs which are very powerful and very, very addictive, and they're making a whole lot of money on it. I don't blame you know anybody for making money, but at some point, is there any thought that maybe we should be talking to the drug companies and saying, listen, what, what you have put out there is just so strong and so addictive. Yeah. Sorry, you want to stay? You yeah, want to? I'll just take a quick okay. you know, first, and then I put <laughs> Wendy person. Person. <laughs> No, I, I think both at the federal and at the state level, our legislators are very sensitive to that, and not just the CAPE delegation that has has, has um, come up with some you know proposals to try to address that, but also at, at the federal, uh, and not only the mass delegation, but in a broader way, um, exactly how that responsibility would get tied back. I don't think that that's really been um, fully kind of flushed out yet, but there's there certainly is one of the issues on on substance abuse, and as I mentioned earlier, also on, on mental health, is it's not an area that's overfunded by any means. Um, so right. you hate to hate to get down to money, but sometimes that you know is is can be a gating factor. So I think what people sometimes say is you know is there an opportunity for big pharma to, to fund some of these programs, not only change practices but also be supportive of some of these community efforts that have, that are happening. I think I think they're going to have to, Matt. I mean the the fiscal reality is that people are already changing how things are prescribed and some of these opiates that that came in a crushable snortable smokable form are now only being dispensed in a gel form so that it's you can't do that mm-hmm. you can't abuse it in that in that way although I'm sure someone will figure out yeah, exactly. a, a way to do that but um, so I do think the pharmaceutical companies while well, they're um, pretty much at the top of the mountain right at the moment I think that they're they're gonna see it coming at them from the legislative yeah. Avenues, and we'll probably start to change you, at some level. But I mean, you still need those end of life meds. You still sure. need, um, you know, pain relief for mm-hmm. people that are truly in their last days, and it's, it's just the only humane thing to do. But how it gets into people's hands and what they do with it, that's up to the rest of us to work on. It just is such a scary proposition. Um, I, I, I have just a terrible lower back. I've always gotten, had lower back problems, and I've gone, you know, seen my doctor, gone to the hospital at times before, and I actually don't want any of those pills. You know, I don't even want yeah. the temptation of it, to I'm be honest with you. i that a lot from people now, yeah, I don't want the, away the prescription. Yeah, I don't want the temptation of it. You know, I, I will ask, you know, I, I think that I get recently, um, uh, I can't think of it, it's, uh, it's prescription strength Advil, I guess. Mm-hmm. What would that be? Is it uh, naproxen or something? or it's whatever, it, it, these big pills, it's basically like a big aspirin, you know, and it's not <laughs> addictive. And I said, how many of those can I take safely? I'll take those. I don't want to take any of these narcotic things. It's not that I think I'd get addicted to it, but when you see what's happening out there, it's yeah. I'm scared. I don't want to even take a couple. And like, Jesus, now I better take a couple more and go down that road. Beth? So, yeah, I was just going to weigh in on the something Terry said, and I think this is where we really need you know, to stay focused on it, is that there's not just one strategy, that this is multiple strategies with multiple sectors of our community. And getting back to what you said, you know, it's not just uh, educating people who are prescribing, including oral surgeons and, and uh, all of the health professionals. It's also working with coaches. It's working with student athletes. It's working with athletic directors to really educate people about what are the risk factors if you are prescribed a painkiller, an opioid painkiller. And and just, I think, raising people's awareness, and you mentioned it yourself, your awareness has been raised. And so we have a lot to do with multiple sectors about raising awareness um, 
about addiction and and uh, in, in in what can lead to addiction. I think um, we've got lots of stories. We don't need to go into them, but I think raising awareness among a broad um, range of people is very very important. One thing that I found troubling uh, about uh, two weeks ago or so, we did a story that several Cape Cod school departments right now are, are a couple. I think Sandwich, maybe Mashpee right now. A couple have already implemented Narcan. And for those uh, listeners who aren't familiar, I'll give you the 22nd version of Narcan. It's basically this non-addictive drug that is a, 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 a administered to somebody who is in the middle of an overdose, and it can literally bring you back to life in just a short amount of time if it's administered in uh, in enough time, if you will. And so school districts are actually in the process of looking to get Narcan into the schools. I spoke with one of the head nurses at Monomoy, and I think we also spoke with one of the healthcare professionals in Barnesville. One of the things that I was kind of shocked about initially, I said, is it that bad that we have to have Narcan in the schools for kids? Kids and what the answer was? Well, you know, at some levels, there they have seen some occasions of that, but even more so. And I guess this is just as troubling to me. They need they want to have Narcan in the schools because, and this is hard to believe, but they're having staff teachers sometimes that may come in in an, in an overdose situation, uh, people who work in the in the in the in the school. And one nurse told us parents they've had situations when a parent shows up at school and the parent goes into an overdose. And when you hear that, does that shock you that you that we have to put Narcan in our schools now, Terry? Uh, um, it is. I think it's shocking and it's sad. And I think that that's part of the reason why you know a lot of people are uh, devoting their time. You know, the, I think one of the key things about Narcan is that you administer it, but then what happens later? What's the next step? There's actually a, a kind of a, a novel pilot happening. It's a collaboration um, with Gosnell and some of the local police departments, and we were fortunate enough to participate and be able to provide some funding that. Uh, the counselors and a police officer will go out to a person after they've had a Narcan um, uh, administration to try to get them and them and their families interested in recovery because the stats that the law enforcement folks had said that people were getting Narcan administration without being in recovery. It was very, it was actually the majority of people weren't in any kind of program. So this is trying to get folks to say, okay, this has happened to you and it saved your life, but what's the next step? And right. that's, you know, when we talk about awareness, it's letting people know what resources are out there and, and what they can do because not everyone knows. And we hear a lot from yeah. people that if it didn't happen to them before in their family, they don't even know where to begin. Right. One of the subjects in that HBO film said that she had narcan multiple times. Right. And unfortunately, that woman was one of the women that died you in know, that film. Yeah, Beth? not to interrupt you, no, but please, I, I mean, I think it, there's an opportunity here, you know, um, for looking outside of the box. And, and Terry mentioned a kind of an innovative approach, looking for natural points of, of intervention for people who are actively using. And I think that uh, that pilot with Gosnold and, and different police uh, departments is, is an example of that. There's other opportunities that we're looking at where you could um, happening in an emergency department where you could possibly um, hook up or connect a rec somebody in recovery, a recovery coach with somebody who's just been Narcan. So there's opportunities to really develop these innovative programs where you're maximizing your points of um, intervention and in, in hopefully moving people towards treatment. Um, you know, what we know about um, addiction is that it's a chronic a medical condition, it's a, a chronic uh, brain disease, and it's something that over the course of your life, you're going to, you know, there are going to be opportunities for you, or um, not opportunities, but there's going to be periods where you may, um, a, you know, you may go into remission, so to speak. And so we like to talk about addiction almost like you would talk about, um, uh, for example, diabetes, so that mm -hmm. you're going, it's a life long chronic right. disease you're going to be managing. We have a couple of moments left to go. We're doing a double segment on this, and we could probably do three, four mm -hmm. segments in a row. But what I'd like to do in the final moments we have here is because one of the things we did want to focus on today was looking forward in solutions. So I'm going to go to each of you and have each of you give me kind of a quick summary from each of your respective pillars of what you're doing education-wise you know, and prevention-wise moving ahead. So Beth, I'll stay with you from the county sure. standpoint. Give us kind of like a 60-second rundown of what's going to be happening in the coming sure. months. Sure. So um, uh, we're working really quickly closely with, uh, on, a, on a primary prevention model, working with uh, Cheryl Bartlett in Cape Cod Healthcare, presenting this model to the school. It's a multi-prong uh, model, so it includes um, programming for the little kids, you know, K through five, a primary, evidence-based primary prevention program in every uh, sixth grade across Cape Cod, a screening 
uh, that would be uh, hopefully accompanying something like a BMI screening. So it becomes part of the regular uh, screening that happens. And then um, if, if kids are identified at risk, is that then there is an avenue for treatment if, uh, or, and counseling. And so it's a, it's a comprehensive primary prevention uh, program with, uh, with lots of components. So that's one of the things that we're working on in the, in the prevention area. I could talk about some other things, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, right well, now. We're going to we're going to revisit this very okay. soon from Cape Cod Healthcare. Terry uh, Terry Hearn, uh, education wise, looking forward, what's going to be happening? What are we going to see over the next couple right. of months? So, in addition to the youth program in the schools that Beth just relayed, we're also doing some activities with a number of community collaborators around places where kids congregate after school. So, we're trying to cl- combine the in-school approach and the out-of-school approach, whether that be sports or other types of activities. On the education side, we're also continuing to do work with our uh, with our physicians and also with our staff. So we have staff, uh, whether it be in the emergency rooms or in other um, parts of the hospital that are medical professionals, maybe not substance abuse um, experts. And so that's another area of expertise and knowledge that um, they're frankly anxious to, to learn more about and how to best take care of these patients. And then I think the third thing is really integrating this behavioral health piece because I can't say enough how important that we can't take the substance abuse issue out from the mental health approach. So we're going to continue to build those services, spread them out across the Cape. That's sort of been a strategy of Cape Cod Healthcare to push out primary care, looking to push out behavioral health care and make it more accessible to folks as well. Wendy Northcross, from the Chamber standpoint, uh, what can we expect for education, you know, uh, prevention, et cetera? What will the Chamber be doing? Well, certainly trying to get more tools into the hands of employers. You have to remember, Matt, of the 10,000 businesses in Cape Cod, 98% of them are very small em- employers. So they don't have the time or the energy sometimes to go get the tools that they need. We'll, we'll try to get that to them in terms of um, resources for people that may be affected. But also, how do we pay for some of this stuff? I can see us advocating for insurance coverage that's more than a quick fix. You know, people need to be admitted for a long enough recovery period that can actually break a pattern. So um, why isn't insurance actually covering some of that? And the other the other issue that goes back to the really small employers is larger companies have employee assistance plans. They have insurance that kind of helps bring resources right into the workplace. Small employers just don't do that. So we're looking at, into um, are there group insurance plans that we can you know, get an umbrella policy and a small employer can be covered under that. So some of those um, direct tools to help people pay for help. I hope we provided the listeners a little bit of education here about what's happening from the standpoint of not just focusing as we did with the issue we did at the beginning of our first segment, but really looking at what's being done proactively here on Cape Cod. There'll be a lot more conversation about this as we move forward in the future. Wendy Northcross, Terry Ahern, and Beth Albert, thank you to the three of you for taking extra time with us today and uh, doing an extra segment on this uh, very important topic, what I think is really the biggest pressing issue we have here, uh, not only Cape, but around the country right now. So thanks to all three of you for coming by today. Appreciate it very much. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt. It's important. Thanks. And thanks for being with us today here on the Sunday Journal.